do you think about this, Jeff? That's the one I heard when I was a little kid listening to a pastor. And he said something that he thought was really obvious, but I could tell by looking around that the people in the congregation did not like it. So it was a small enough church. You could actually hear some of the rumblings. And he just held up his Bible and he said, well, if you've got a problem with this, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. And, and the way he said it, uh, even as a little kid, I was sitting there thinking, is there something really wrong with this? I don't, I don't see what he sees. Anyway, but it's just, but then, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this video. This is worth YouTube uh, all, all by itself. It's worth YouTube's actually, existence. <laughs> oh, worth YouTube's entire existence is the video. Just Google this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. And the video comes up and it is a pure 1970s, including probably, you know, the, the Vaseline on the lens and um, some girls and, you know, dresses singing. God said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. And then a bunch of guys come out in powder blue suits. I'm not making any of this up from behind a tree uh, like elves. <laughs> and, um, and then they join into the song. And I just, it, 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 when I, it just scarred me, I think it actually was the problem. <laughs> I'm lingering on a thing you said. Are you saying they put Vaseline on lenses in the 70s? Oh, isn't that the way they make it look so, uh, they take away all your wrinkles. And, like they smudge Vaseline you know, all the, days the before, black? Yeah, the days before GCI, the CGI, yeah, they just That's how they make it kind of soft. They soften oh, it. They soften the person, make them look uh, angelic. Oh. It's not that the camera <laughs> has to like cram through any tight spaces or no. <laughs> That got wrong. I'm sorry. Okay, continue. <laughs> Don't worry. That part gets edited out. Yeah, we have an editor. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was crazy when I, when I thought about it, I thought everything in that saying brings it down to me, what I think and what I feel. And that's where it started to really bug me. Um, if this is about me, then why do I need the Bible at all? So I've been doing a lot of rethinking about it. Hmm. Well, let's think, I mean, what bugs me a little bit about that one, not bugs me, but something that's interesting to think about is that there is some truth to the fact that God said something in the Bible. And we have to deal with that. And we, and we have to accept it for what it is. And we have to think through those things. Hmm. But I, I guess, I guess to me, the issue with a saying like that is, is, you're right. It puts my belief as the thing that settles it. And it's something where we're not even wrestling with it. It's just like, how do you nope. know what's the, even like, how do you know the Bible is legit or something like that? Sure. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, why, so why, why don't we write that, write out the questions that we've got and see if there are answers. I mean, tons of people, we have speakers come to Summit Ministries every summer whose whole goal in life is helping people answer questions about the Bible, looking at the internal evidence, the external evidence, you know, what does it mean to say the Bible's inspired or inerrant and, and really digging into it. But just to say, you know, because my pastor said, this is true. I'm just going to accept it and move on. Stop thinking about it. All of a sudden, your faith is on the margins of your life, right? Rather than at the center. It's, it's, it's something that, oh, well, that's taken care of. I can set that one on the shelf. Now I can go on with everything else. Well, you know what they say? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Oh, gosh. That's right. They say, oh, that. They say that in Jeff's book. <laughs> that's the one I think probably is going to be the most upsetting. I did a workshop on this the other day, and I could just, I, I brought that one up. I could see people glaring at me. Um, I said, well, look, does God love sinners? Yes. Does God hate sin? Yes. Does that put us in a position where we should say that to somebody else? Because if I'm saying to somebody, well, you know, I love you, but I hate your sin. What I'm essentially saying is that your sin is worse for you than mine is for me. And again, I'm bringing it right back to me. I'm making myself rather than the Bible, the standard. Wrong. <laughs> I don't know why that made me. You said mm, like you were going to start responding yeah. and then you didn't. So I was waiting for affirmation and I didn't get it. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Um, let me have another one. Um, three nails. This is a math problem. Three nails. Plus one cross equals four given. That's math. Three, one, four. Have you turned that into a t-shirt yet? I think no, it already exists. Probably already. Yeah, we, we Googled church signs. <laughs> <laughs> Our extensive research to interview you <laughs> consisted mostly of Googling church signs. <laughs> no, that's great. No, that's that's serious. I mean, taking <laughs> taking that one minute made all the difference. <laughs> if you want to contact God, try knee mail. Huh? That's just a dad joke. <laughs> Maybe all church signs are just a dad. Yeah, a dad having fun. Yeah. Having fun. I mean, most pastors are dads, I guess. I have a pastor's kid who's standing there looking at that sign going, why, why God? <laughs> um, okay. So while you talk in your book about simplicism, sounds that different from simplicity? Like it's a religion of simplicity. Like I am a simplicist. Yeah, I think it is. Have you ever had that experience where you're, you're hearing somebody speak on a topic and then they just summarize the whole thing in one clever little phrase and everybody goes, Ooh, that's good. And they all, mm. all write it down. You know, that's what I'm talking about. That simplicity. I, I'm not really all that into it, but it's, I mean, I think it's probably a virtue wanting to live a less complicated life, but Simplicism, and again, I, I thought I coined it, but then I Googled it, and you don't coin anything in the day of Google. It's, it's 
It's just already there. It already it's exists. Full, but it's a full religion with leadership and everything already. It's, oh, it's already, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fundraising mechanism, have, everything. They, they got have Pope. Yeah. <laughs> so is it true that something isn't true unless it's easy to understand and summarize? I mean, that'd make, a, that'd make for a nice life. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, that's a, that's a tricky, that's a tricky aspect of faith. And, you know, the people that I hang out with in my town, uh, they want a lot of answers. I was talking to a guy the other day. He was an atheist. And he, and I said, Hey, I'm writing this book. He said, what's it on? I said, well, I'm trying to, to grapple with questions like, you know, how could God be good? If there's evil in the world, you know, what about hell? Is that fair of God? Isn't the old Testament anti-woman, anti-gay, pro-slavery, all of that. And he just sat there very quietly. And all of a sudden he said, I have all of those questions. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is amazing because I had always been led to believe that non-believers are people who have thought all this through and intentionally rejected it. And Christians are the ones who just don't really think it through, but just automatically accept it. And, uh, it was a lot of fun to realize, wow, this is a different, this is a different world than I thought. I could actually talk to my atheist and agnostic neighbor and say, Hey, here's something that I'm thinking, you know, this is what I'm thinking about what the Bible means. Can you give me some feedback on it? And it's, it's legit. So I'm having these kinds of conversations all of the time. Um, and it's a lot more fun. It's a, it's a lot more fun than just, you know, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Would you say it's a moral, um, thing? I mean, I struggle with this cause I, this is the kind of mind I have. I mean, when I was around 19, I've told the story on this podcast before, but I wrote every question I had out in a notebook and kind of set out to answer all these questions. A lot of more ones you just listed. And I, I went through a struggle of faith. I talked to atheists and argued with atheists and found things in the Bible I realized didn't realize were there or that I didn't have an argument for. But I also realized that like, there's a lot of Christians that just don't think that way. Uh, and I almost have an envy for some of the ones that they can be very simple and they're okay with it. <laughs> I don't know. But then there's also people in, that are atheists. They're like that too. Or, you know, they're going to think, go so far as to, usually if you're an atheist, you've thought some about what you believe, but then there's people that just kind of have a few platitudes and they just go along with those. And, uh, and I wonder, is it more a personality trait or a way that some people need that and some people just don't need it? Or is it a moral thing? Like if you're being simple with your faith, are you sinning? Do you think you, do you think it's happening more? Or, or I mean, I'm wondering if it's a function of time. The more complex the world is, mm. the more I need certain things to be settled so I don't have to worry about them anymore. In other words, I'm not Probably. trying. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying like, yeah, I mean, people came from not long ago. We were all living in smaller groups and it was easier to. This is what everybody says this is what everybody believes. And you never really think outside of that. Now it's different. We're all being rapid fire pelted with different ideas and challenges all day long and information. So it probably does have another effect. We, we just kind of pick a few, pick and choose the things that feel best and just kind of believe those. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Are you asking us questions? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll ask the question. Wait, wait, who's being interviewed here? <laughs> <laughs> this is such a, um, this is a, this is a big deal for the students that we work with when they find that uh, people, atheists or non-believers or whatever, people who are, you know, believe things that you know, are not part of the Christian worldview probably haven't given it a lot more thought than Christians have. So I, I think you're right. I mean, there's something about everybody just wants it to be simpler. Everybody just mm-hmm. thinks that, man, if I could just get it down to a, cl- a quick phrase that I could give somebody if they ask a question, then I can deflect the argument rather than absorb it. And I don't know. I mean, we're teaching our students at Summit that most of your conversations are going to, are going to start with something like, I'm curious. Mm-hmm. You know, why do you say that? I'm curious. Do you think that's the whole story? I'm curious. What, you know, what, do, what do you mean by when you say there is no God? What do you mean by God? And mm-hmm. When students are learning to ask those kinds of questions, you can see a lot of that anxiety melt away. Oh, wait a second. I don't even have to have an answer for that. I just need to engage with the person in a dialogue and just see where it goes. So, because it does say in scripture to be ready with an answer. And I'm curious how far we take that. Like, is it, because there are people like, you know, guys like you, we had Greg Kokel on, uh, we just had Jeff Durbin on, guys that are like full on apologists who debate atheists. Are we all called to be that uh, vigorous in our research or, I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not trying to pin you down. It's just something I'm curious. Like, I get curious about that. Like, is there, what is our calling in that area to have those answers? Well, you know, the, the, when Greg teaches on tactics at Summit Ministries, um, you know, his approach is, is brilliant. That you're always starting with questions that you have to show that you're present in the conversation and that you're willing to listen before anything that you say will really keep, uh, will really matter. So our, our point is find ways to keep the conversation going rather than to shut it down. And I, I think that's, I think that's pretty, it's pretty consistent with the way Greg teaches it. But mm-hmm. at some point in the conversation, you're going to have to say, gosh, there is something that you just brought up that I am curious about, or here's an answer that I learned that, you know, let me run this by you and see what you think, but it's all done in the context of the conversation. So, you know, our, our students are, their library is growing. They're getting books by, you know, evidence of Manson, a verdict by Josh and Sean McDowell, tactics by Greg Kokel, uh, you know, the, Chris, the handbook to Christian apologetics by Douglas Grotice. You know, those kinds of things are being a part of their library, but they're not, they're not, they're using it in a totally different way. They're not using it to win using it to invite conversation and dialogue to, to reestablish community rather than to uh, prove that they're they're right mm-hmm. it seems to me that when you when you do it that way the defensiveness goes away and when the defensiveness goes away the fear goes away i don't even have to have an answer at this moment because that's not the you know this is not a, a contest this is a conversation but if god is real then how come rabbits eat their own poop <laughs>
<laughs> he stole my atheist argument that I used on Greg Kokel. I know. So we owned Greg Kokel. He had no response to yeah. that. And oh. now we're owning... I was just looking, Dr. Jeff Myers. My rabbit came, my, we have a rabbit, and I was looking at its poop yesterday. <laughs> Wait, what? You were just... <laughs> and I realized there are some poops that look kind of like they're made of little hay balls, and there's ones that look like little black ones. So I'm like, oh, you must eat these ones, and then these... Those are the second phase poop and the first phase poops. I'm no sorry. Idea. I am so sorry, Jeff. You really studied this. <laughs> I, I once heard an atheist debate that the way his proof of that there's no God is because rabbits digest poop by... Or not, they digest their food by first they poop it once, then they eat it, and then they digest it again because their digestive systems can't handle one pass through. So they're imperfect, which means God would have... God messed up on rabbits. I just thought it was kind of a hilarious, fascinating argument. Maybe God just thinks it's hilarious if rabbits eat their own poop or something. I don't know. He's funny. You know, he's got a sense of humor, I assume. But, um, so yeah, so Kyle brought it back. Dr. Jeff Myers is currently frantically Googling. <laughs> That's right. He went through eight years of school. He's a doctor. He's got a PhD. And here he is talking about poop with a couple of the guys who have been dubbed the Christian Beavis and Butthead. It all comes down to the rabbit poop. <laughs> this is awesome. No, no. I'm, tell me more about that. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to share that update the other day. Seeing my rabbit. Um, how about choose the bread of life or you are toast? Oh, is that, was that on a sign? That was actually these, these metaphors are very confused because <laughs> they're not the bread. Plus, Jesus I like toast. Bread. Yeah, choose the bread of life, or you are toast. I know, but it's yeah. you're the toast. It's just of word death. association jokes. It's not even a good pun. Choose the bread I'm of still, life, or you are the toast of death. That's what I'd, I'd change that to. I'm still mulling over that I'm a, I am the football and not on God's team. That just <laughs> you're getting kicked through the goalposts. <laughs> I, I have just never had a day like that. <laughs> it's a good song. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've met people who are very like, uh, you know, and I grew up with people, uh, good Christian people that were very like just have faith. And they were okay with that, you know, and, mm. and they didn't feel like they needed to have an answer to everything. I'm still kind of wrestling with this because it's, mm -hmm. to me, I had to go out into kind of the world of having these answers. Uh, when I was like in high school, I had to go out and, and read apologetics and it was like this whole world. But I think for me, it even got to a place of being unhealthy where it's like, I need to, I need to dissect and debunk everybody else's yeah. worldview. Yeah, I got that too, like being the atheist destroyer online. You know, and then it was like my faith would, my faith would go from like a very strong, if I want an argument to like, oh, you know, yeah. I don't have an answer for this. Oh. You know, my faith is very much based on how good the argument, mm -hmm. or how, how, you know, whatever my last argument was, how good it was. Yeah. And you stretch your eyes, like word Olympics. People can like yeah. twist their words around and almost win any debate. They can even win a debate. They don't actually believe if you're good enough with words. Yeah. So for me, I had to kind of arrive at a place where there are things I look at in the Bible and I'm like, I don't really understand how it works. And I'm like, but I know it does. And I know, I know there are very smart people out there. And I know that there are answers out there if I go and search, but I don't necessarily need to wrestle with every single one of those all the time or argue with people all the time. So what I like about what Greg does and what it sounds like some of ministries uh, does is that you equip people not necessarily to go out and find every single answer and debate every single person and win every argument, mm -hmm. but to simply like have a plan in place and not give the stupid easy answer. Because I, I kind of hate those those little platitudes more than I hate like an atheist argument. Like yeah. I hate when someone does a really bad argument for Christianity or says something really dumb and you're just like, I agree with I agree with you, mm -hmm. but that's a really dumb way to get there. It bugs me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I don't I, know if there was a question there, but just I, I, I just sort of picture all of the future <laughs> arguments that a person's going to have. You know, when a, when a student tells me a cliche that they're they're pretty sure of. I just kind of imagine, all right, you know, for example, a student said to me, hey, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it takes to believe in creation, which I, I knew he had heard at a workshop someplace. But I just kind of imagined him saying that in class to the biology professor. <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, He's dropping Frank Turk. Right? Oh, Frank Turk. Well, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Yeah, yeah, this, this goes, this is, this is, a, <laughs> this is, this is the, the drop kick, the, the evolution through the goalpost kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. But, you know, every biology professor in America is ready for that. They know exactly what to say. They know how to respond. They know how to get the class laughing at the student and all of that stuff. So I sometimes wonder if I'm just trying to help them not use cliches just as a self-protective measure. But, mm -hmm. but, but what if in, instead, if, you know, you were talking earlier about how you've kind of felt like you had to have every argument. And, and that makes it about you then, right? So it does the same thing, ironically, that having some of these cliches does to us. It makes it all about me and whether I can respond and whether I sound smart and whether I can convince myself. Hmm. But if it really is about God and about his world, I mean, if Jesus really is not only our savior, but gives us a framework for understanding all of reality, then I can relax from having to obsess about that. And I don't have to be the center of my world. I don't have to think that I'm the center of my world. I can just stop. Hey, tell me more about that. How did you get to that place? How did you arrive at that answer? You know, what happened in your life that that kind of made, shaped your thinking in that way. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I had a, it was kind of a funny conversation here with uh, a mom who was, she was sitting on the sidelines watching uh, our soccer. I, my son was playing in the game as well. So we sat down and started chatting and she's really into meditation. She said, um, hey, I got to tell you about these new meditation techniques I'm learning. And, and she just, so she just went on and on about it for quite a while. And I just kept saying, hey, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. And, but after about 10 minutes, she stopped and said, how do you see all of this? And I, it was just, it was one of those moments where I thought, okay, this is exactly why I'm in this conversation. Because now I'm not just saying, here's what I believe. I hope you listen to me. I've been asked the question. And uh, so I said, hey, I really, I really am convinced that God is a person and not a, not a force. And she just looked at me so stunned. She said, really, why would you say that? And so I said, well, you know. Star Wars is dumb. Sorry. <laughs> I had to get that in there. Jesus is, uh, 
you know, Jesus is God in the flesh, and here's what I here's how I understand this, and how I understand God's nature. But she just could not at that point stop asking questions. So if God is like that, how do you do you talk to Him? You know, how do you talk to God? And it, it was the most innocent, natural kind of conversation that took place, just because it started out with questions rather than with, hey, you know, this this was something I saw in a church sign someplace, so I'm going to give it to you. Then did you drop kick her through the goalpost? Uh, absolutely, yeah, that was right. <clears throat> that's 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 one thing you do in soccer all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, you, you got something? No, go for it. This is purely uh, my speculation. It's nowhere in scripture, but I have this curious. I mean, I know that God makes us each unique, and I wonder what do you think about the idea that God gives us each? I don't know if He gives us doubt, but it seems like we each have different capacities for how far our doubt goes or how much we question. And because I, I have found myself having to to keep myself from being too judgmental of other Christians, sometimes I. I have to go, you know, so maybe God just made me differently. This is the way my mind works. Like I, you know, I can't, I have a much harder time accepting uh, axioms and things like that. And I don't want to say that in an, in an insulting way. Like I think that for some people, maybe they're just their energy. It saves their energy to like go other, you know, just, you know, the nice little old lady at church who completely lives on a few axioms, Christian axioms or whatever. She's a complete servant and she's, you know, a complete minister and uh, a prayer warrior. I mean, she has an amazing prayer life because she's not spending a lot of time doubting and questioning. <laughs> so I don't know. Like, I, do, you, do you think there's anything to that? I mean, that, that, and that's just purely a, a thought as we talk. It's not from your notes or anything. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I think it's fair to say that your mind does work differently than anybody else's. Yeah, I'll that's say, fair. especially with yeah. Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair to say. Uh, you know, do you I, think I, God's I, involved in that? I think that's just purely uh, circumstances. I think it's a fair point. I, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why somebody would accept a simple answer rather than try to dig into it. Um, and it could just be the complexity of life. It could just be that's what's worked for them. It could be they haven't ever really run up against any challenges that, that would require them to think differently about that. But, and I'm telling you, when I ask questions like, hey, how did you arrive at that belief? Or, you know, what happened in your life? What's, the, what's your story? Uh, I have never found that person to actually exist that you're describing. Mm-hmm. Everybody can say, hey, look, if I'm going to be really honest with you, this is what I wrestle with. And I, I found people, young people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I found there's people, I mean, everybody, nobody's going to be like, no, I don't need an answer to that. I'm good. But I do find... Um, even when I was in when I was in team ministry in young life, there was times where uh, I would, you know, kids would want the answers to those things. And when you, a lot of them, are, it's it's getting into weeds to try to really talk about why would God uh, allow evil or you know why did God create Satan or those kinds of. It's not a simple uh, platitude answer, and they they've been living on platitudes, and they do want an answer. But if it's not one of those platitudes, a lot of them kind of zone out and don't want to. Um, are, they may not be that interested once. Yeah, have, right, uh, right. Unless their parents have gone through a divorce or they had a sibling mm-hmm. commit suicide. I mean, life has a way of confronting all of those cliches. Right. Right? So, you got to be in that spot where you need to hear it. I, I, that's how I approach it with our students. Say, so you may, uh, if you, if these bad things have not happened to you, glad. I'm so glad for you. But I just want you to understand that anybody who has ever said I could never believe in God, uh, who would a God who would allow evil in the world, is saying it because they've gone through something horrible and they've tried to settle it in their minds that this is this is probably the only thing you've got in life is that God just doesn't really care. So. If you're you're ready to talk to that person and ask those questions and say, hey, sounds like there's a big story behind that, and I've got the time. Could you know? Would you be willing to talk to me about it? Um, it it's it's a pretty it's a pretty amazing. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, if you, but but think of, isn't that true in every area of life? If I've just stuffed myself full of some kind of food, it doesn't matter whether what you're bringing me on the tray is exquisite or not. I'm just gonna I want it. Right? Mm-hmm. Take it. Sure, that looks great, but I just filled up with six Big Macs. You know, like, I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not hungry anymore. No, oh, I'm not gonna eat that Chick Fil A sandwich <laughs> full of Big Macs. I wonder. I wonder an analogy. No, that's that's a good that's a good Christian analogy right there. Too. Yeah, very important. Do we still like Chick-fil-A? Every man at them? Yeah, I don't know. I can't. It's just. Are I we still mad at them? I don't know. Oh. I can't. Keep They're still closed on Sundays, so they, there's points there. They get some points. A few points. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Send us questions, people. And yeah, Jeff's book is on Amazon. Other places, books are sold. It's called Unquestioned Answers: Rethinking Ten Christian Cliches to Re- Rediscover Biblical Truths. Good job. I said that very well. Yeah. So. You sure did. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> we did it. We had to end with affirmation. Yeah, we affirm you. <laughs> Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. We accept these platitudes because we believe that atheists are this like devil character out there who doesn't have